In this episode, we will be looking at bicycles, how southern cities treat them, and how we should treat them. This is a nice change of pace for me, as it means I can do a lot less research and rely more on my personal experience and expertise. As I have been a primary bicycle commuter for eight years now, and have worked on numerous bike projects as both a planner and a design engineer, so it's fair to say I know my way around a bike lane. Let's start by thinking about what you can use a bike for. If you ask most people what they do on a bike, in 95% of cases, the first thought is probably a recreational ride, maybe going out for exercise. But with a safe and convenient bike route, your trips to a coffee shop, to the dentist, to a train station, or to work become that exercise and recreation. In my experience, anything under two miles is an easy trip, and anything under five miles is pretty good for a commute. With the growing availability of e-bikes, these trips are even easier. Super quick digression, but five years ago, I was a little anti-e-bike. I thought they were fine for some folks, but real bikes would continue to use thigh power, not electric power. But having seen the development of the technology and the proliferation of producers, including models meant to haul a family around, I think e-bikes are leading the charge to get Americans out of our cars. This actually leads me to my next point, the types of riders and types of infrastructure. For the past 20 years or so, engineers and planners have viewed cyclists as belonging to one of four groups laid out by Roger Geller in Portland, Oregon. Strong and fearless, enthused and confident, interested and concerned, and no way, no how. This is a good analysis, and it comes with the observation that most folks probably fit into the group interested but concerned, meaning folks that want to ride bikes but have safety concerns, which I think the past 20 years or so have proven right. However, I think that we can simplify this into two categories. First, riders that want to fight cars, and riders that want to stay as far away from cars as possible. Related, there are bike lanes that protect riders, and bike lanes that don't. There are plenty of old men and young men who like riding in traffic, or don't mind riding next to traffic. For these people, the thin white line of a bicycle gutter is more than adequate. Otherwise, they'll be happy riding in Lycra in traffic. But if you're something other than a strapping young lad or an old man in Lycra, you typically want to avoid cars. Therefore, you're only really comfortable riding somewhere with physical separation from cars. For instance, this bike lane in Chattanooga that uses planters, concrete stops, and a row of parked cars to separate cyclists from drivers. Maybe this one in Charlotte. It's a two-way bike lane that uses a curb to separate the cars and bikes. How about this one in Nashville? Here, you have what they call a cycle track. They moved the bike lane from the road to behind the curb and gutter. I would describe all of these as real bike lanes. To use our previous dichotomy, these are bike lanes that protect the rider. And to go back to Geller, these are meant for interested but concerned riders. This is the modern issue for bike infrastructure. Lots of our cities have bike networks, and if you turn on the bike layer of Google Maps, you'd see a disconnected web of green. But if we go back to our examples, they are either the only or one of only a few real bike lanes in those cities. Meaning that if you are a cyclist who wants to avoid cars, or interested but concerned rider, then these cities don't have many ways for you to get around safely. Later, we'll look at what fixing the problem would actually mean for a city. But before that, I want to take a look at how we got here. Our primary source for the old ways of doing bike is the 1980 Chattanooga-Hamilton County Bicycle Plan. This was created by the Regional Planning Commission and published September 1980. It covers the state of play in 1980, then specific opportunity corridors and challenges, an analysis of rider types and needs, then it lays out the plan and ends with details of how to actually do this. I'll go ahead and read a few segments, and the goal here is to compare and contrast their goals, analysis, and perspective with ours starting with the intro. An EPA study claimed that on a nationwide basis, widespread use of bicycles for trips of less than two minutes, whether for recreation, commuting, visiting, shopping, home to school, or errands, would save two and a half billion gallons of gasoline each year. I just want to note the focus on gallons of gas while ignoring greenhouse gases. The oil crisis was fresh in the memory, I suppose. With the increasing popularity of bicycles for exercise and recreational purposes, and with work trip lengths of four to six miles considered feasible, the development of bikeways consonant with the needs of local bicyclists 
and adapted to the hilly topography became of paramount importance in the chattanooga urban area it was felt the existence of well-planned bikeway routes could be expected to encourage and increase adult use of bicycles for all the above-mentioned purposes thus accomplishing energy and dollar savings I'd like to offer that modern e-bikes are a great solution to hilly terrain, and they weren't something even considered in the 1980s. Also, it's interesting the report talks about the needs of local cyclists, but, spoilers, won't talk about the kind of physically separate infrastructure I showed earlier. Finally, it's worth noting how this report is interested in energy and dollar savings, but not climate change or road safety. Sign of the Times. Progress in finding solutions to some of the restraints has been made recently. A bike route has been established to run from just below the Chickamauga Creek Bridge on Brainerd Road, going west through the Macaulay Tunnel, then south on Dodds Avenue to Main Street, then west on Main Street to the Riverfront Parkway, a total distance of about nine miles. The bike route signs have been installed at reasonable intervals for the length of the route. So the visuals I'm showing hopefully convey this point, but I think it's kind of insane that putting up signs along these routes counts as progress in 1980. Every road mentioned is a high-traffic, high-stress road. Trust me, I rode on Main Street for years. Consider this a preview for how little this report will end up accomplishing. Policies devised to facilitate the implementation of biking objectives were 1. Develop bicycle safety education programs. Education programs, yeah, great. Hello drivers, please don't murder cyclists. Yeah, call me skeptical. Two, clearly define the boundaries between automobile and bicycle right-of-ways and clearly mark bicycle routes. So this is basically calling for more striping and signs, which is what ended up happening, so points for predictions. But of course, from 2023, we know how ineffective this is. Three, provide separate bikeways when it becomes financially feasible. <sighs> what could have been when financially feasible? Oh, what a kicker. All the research they did, all the research we have today, if we want to convince folks en masse to leave the car behind, this is what we need. And to talk about the finances, when looking at transportation projects, bike infrastructure is basically free. Highways and rail transit cost billions, roadway widenings and intersection upgrades cost millions. Meanwhile, the nicest bikeway cost will be in the hundreds of thousands. So I'm saying this report is wrong. It's not about the money. It's a political decision of how our transportation right-of-way is distributed. 4. Investigate the possibility of establishing a bicycle court to hear cases involving bicycle violations. This would be nice. Most states, even here in the southeast, have laws protecting cyclists, but the follow-through leaves something to be desired. 5. Require the registration of bicycles and licensing of owners to facilitate identification of bicycle and owner should theft arise. So, in my opinion, this is basically impossible to do. Bikes are just so decentralized. The ultimate libertarian dream. 6. Apply bicycle laws and ordinances consistently to adults and children alike. So, this is talking about giving tickets to cyclists, including kids. Um, no, no. This is just drivers being mad. Uh, biking is a victimless crime. Like, seriously, it's really, really hard to hurt someone on a bike, even if you try. Just, just let the bikes be free. So what have we learned? Well, we know what kind of results the report got as bicycle travel fell from the 70s through the 80s to today. I'd say this report saw bikes as guests on the road, and that they want to accommodate better. But that's just not what the needs of everyday riders are. So now we know how we got here, and we know what the goals are. Let's look at what's needed to make a network of protected bike infrastructure. Well, if we look at our example cities, we can see that the bikeways have been built from the three R's, rivers, rails, and roads. We'll discuss them in that order. River trails are the most common, for lots of reasons. They're scenic, they're part of a park system, funding can come from many sources, and land next to rivers is generally available. Larger examples would be in Chattanooga, Nashville, and Charlotte, but you can find these in smaller communities like Kingsport, Tennessee, or Lebanon, Tennessee, where it even has a connection to the commuter rail. So, we have some strong upsides, but are there any drawbacks? 
Well, river paths will follow the river, so you get the route nature gives you, which can be windy and can miss key nodes. Looking at you, North Carolina. Also, if a project is built with flood mitigation funds, it might be used for flood mitigation. So, a useful transportation link and the most pleasant option. But a city will need more than just river trails. The second R is rails. This comes as both a rail trail and rail to trail. For our example of a rail trail, we'll be looking at Charlotte and the South End neighborhood. This is two and a half miles of a shared use bike pedestrian path along the Blue Line light rail. This has been a massive success. It makes accessing stations convenient, it's the secret sauce of the neighborhood, and it makes this place walkable in what is otherwise not a very pedestrian friendly city. The other option, Rail 2 Trail, is more complicated. First, there are two excellent videos for additional viewing, Alan Fisher's and How to Build the Worlds. These trails come about whenever a disused rail line gets turned over to bikes and pedestrians. The controversy comes when the rail line in question would be better used as passenger rail. A bad example is in Ashland City, Tennessee. The Cumberland River Bicentennial Trail sits on what was the rail line between Nashville and Clarksville, which, if Nashville ever expands its commuter rail, would be a key link. Our Rail 2 Trail in Unica City will be a better example, where a corridor that's not very useful for transit will get converted. Finally, R number 3, roads. You may be asking, isn't this just bike lanes again? Uh, yes. Firstly, on main corridors with higher traffic, protected bike lanes serve as the most important links in the network. This is because, unlike waterways or abandoned tracks, roads always go to the places people want to go. In our example cities, I'd like to again highlight 12th Avenue South in Nashville for building one and a half miles of protected bike lanes through popular and growing neighborhoods. What about the lower traffic streets? Well, for downtown areas, making a pedestrian street is probably the best option. Chattanooga has a few block-long examples in Walnut Street, 8th Street, and Station Street, all near downtown. Typically, these have been redesigned so the car is a guest and pedestrians have the full width. For the central, dense areas of a city, I think these are key to make walking and biking the preferred way to get around downtown. For the residential, middle neighborhoods of a city, I think Stealing an idea from the original bike city, Portland, Oregon, is best. These are side streets in residential areas that have had a few strategic traffic calming devices put in along the route. These make it inconvenient for cars to drive on. Thus, it's convenient for bikes. I'm a particular fan of the traffic diversions used at intersections, meaning that cars have to turn while bikes flow on through. But what about the very suburban neighborhoods, without any grid? Well, the road layouts actually can help us. They are already designed to prevent through traffic, so you can do what Charlotte did and connect a major bike corridor to the back of these neighborhoods, thus allowing for car light travel in your own neighborhood, then car free travel on the bikeway. If your goal is to turn a far out subdivision into a walkable urban neighborhood, well that is a very different topic, and I'll be covering that in a future episode. Stay tuned. So, rivers, rails, and roads. What does this mean for Unica City, and by extension, the future of our cities? Well, one thing I briefly mentioned, as I've talked about all these bikeways, is that they tend to be pretty isolated. There is no city or town in the southeast that actually has a full network, just a handful of good corridors floating out in space, surrounded by cars. So when you make a city, I'll be sure that our paths connect. Connect to key destinations, connect to transit hubs, and connect to each other. We'll follow the examples I showed earlier. So, rail trails, greenways, and protected bike lanes on main roads, and then pedestrian streets downtown, and all the other residential stuff I mentioned. We'll follow the on-the-ground example of the Unica Electric Trail. It goes from the Riverfront Greenway to downtown and follows all the R's. First, it connects with the Riverfront Greenway I mentioned at the Old Plant Park. Then, it follows the abandoned branch line that used to serve the power plant as it passes suburban neighborhoods. The trail connects to them, either directly via the rear or via an intersection across the main road that would have been upgraded for bike ped safety. The Rail 2 Trail ends in the Hawthorne neighborhood. The bikeway then follows Hawthorne Street itself, becoming a protected bike lane. It stays like this through the inner city, connecting with several neighborhood greenways all in the way. Then, as it approaches the highway around downtown, it jogs over one block in order to avoid the traffic of a highway interchange. Here, it hooks into the downtown pedestrian street grid. In downtown Unica City, certain streets have been decarred roughly in the shape of a pound sign or hashtag sign or tic-tac-toe board. Take your pick. Biking like this is available all around the city. 
you can get from any corner to any other corner on a low stress protected route. All it took was a bit of concrete and inconveniencing some drivers. Worth it. <sighs> it's good to be back. Next episode will either be about Southern Passenger Rail or how to urbanize suburbia. With some calm talk scattered around. In the meanwhile, bike often, bike safe.